The story you're about to hear was told to me in the strictest of confidence. Certain names, dates and locations may have been changed to protect that confidence. Events that feature in this story may be part of the public record. If you believe you recognise any of the people, places or events that feature in this story, I ask you not to reveal any information publicly out of respect for the subject's right to remain anonymous. My name is David Paul Nixon, and this is the New Ghost Stories podcast, where we delve into the New Ghost Stories archive to hear witness accounts of the supernatural. Stories that could be delusions, lies, fantasies, or perhaps even the real thing. Just don't make your mind up until you've listened. It's fairly unusual for me to find myself hunting down a case for New Ghost Stories. Generally speaking, cases come to my attention when people approach me, and I prefer it that way. Not because I'm unwilling to do the legwork, but because experiencing the supernatural is usually at the very least unnerving. As we have heard, it is sometimes very traumatic. And I don't ever want to put people into a position where they're forced to dig up painful memories, or to put any pressure on them to speak out. That's why I've made it a rule to only speak to those who volunteer to share their experiences although it hasn't always been this way. Today's story comes from an earlier point in my ghost stories career, back when I was writing down my first cases and still figuring out how to evaluate what I was hearing, whether I could verify it as likely true, unknown, or just plain false. I was still learning. This case first came to my ear when I was in an unfamiliar part of town, at a bar with friends of friends rather than people I knew, Nevertheless, talk of what I was now working on had reached the ears of someone there, and they started to tell me a story about something of a local legend. It was about a man who claimed to be haunted, who believed there was someone there when there was no one. He could sometimes be seen shouting and screaming in the street on his own. He was apparently clumsy. He would drop things and lash out. He was barred from many local pubs because of his outbursts. People thought he was crazy. No one else at the table that night seemed to know anything about it, and I gave it little consideration. It sounded to me like someone who had serious mental health problems who was not receiving an appropriate level of care. It was sad to hear, but not something in my line of work. I would likely have forgotten this account, if it wasn't for the fact that a few days later I heard a similar story from someone about a man who they would see going to football matches who would behave in sudden and inexplicable ways. They seemed to suddenly jump out of their own skin. They would trip and fall, spill drinks and food, and then get into arguments, sometimes physical altercations with others. Wondering whether it was the same person, I passed on the account that I had heard days before. They seemed to tally. We appeared to be talking about the same person, a man who ranted and raved about being persecuted by a ghost. I'm not a football fan myself, but knowing someone who was and who attended matches locally, I approached them and asked if they could talk to their friends and other fans. Who was this man? Could he find out more for me? I feel uncomfortable about this now, researching background on someone without their knowledge or consent, trading in gossip. It doesn't sit right with me. What right did I have to do that? And yet, the subject of today's story is atypical within the annals of new ghost stories. He is among the few people in the canon who not only feels completely comfortable about talking about their experience, but they do so openly and loudly. After asking around, my friend furnished me with more details and, crucially, a name. But more than that, I heard of a disturbing and violent history. There really was a story here that had traits that could be supernatural. The man in question seemed to be an enigma. He did not seem to have friends, at least not any more. He was not known to have a job. He was no longer a regular match attendee. He was not known to have any regular haunts. Where was he? I found myself playing detective, visiting locations, speaking to witnesses, trying to draw a picture of what had happened to this man. And where was he now? It was quite a while before I was able to discern a few locations where I might encounter him. 
They weren't places I would expect to find him, and certainly not amongst the type of people there. I visited one after another, staying a short time before moving on to the next and then returning for one night after another, until, finally, I spotted him. Even though I'd asked the staff to point him out to me, I knew him straight away. It's hard to describe the way he carried himself exactly. It was as if it was him against the world. And when I approached him, I barely had to say a word. It was as if he was expecting me. When he spoke, I realised that this was a man who had been denied the privacy that usually comes with a ghost story. His experiences had not taken place in the dark, in some isolated location. He had been forced to go through his nightmare in public. It's easy to get caught up in the joy of stories, the sheer thrill of their twists and turns, the pleasure of gossip and rumour. It's a luxury you can enjoy when you're not close. It's easy to stare and pass judgment from a comfortable distance. And this was a man who talked loudly about what he experienced because he had nothing else to lose. Against the judgment and hostility of the world, what did he have left to fight with except his own version of events? When it was over, I felt a little ashamed that I didn't by now know better than to take so casually people's experiences that there are real consequences for real individuals behind every story. People who don't get to just move on when the story comes to an end. His story has no end. It only goes so far. It may still be going on to this day. He wasn't much interested in the new ghost stories project. He consented to be taped, to tell the story more than once. He didn't care about anonymity. He didn't want any names or places changed. Feeling I should consent to his wishes, I have in this story not changed or concealed any of the locations, although I could not bring myself to feature the real names of those involved. Even though the subject did not care, I could not say the same for others who feature in this account. This is a story that brings up all kinds of mixed feelings in me. I felt that in some way I had contributed to the man's suffering, that I was no better than anyone else who pointed and stared and laughed. If nothing else, it taught me to be careful with stories and gossip and rumour. When a story doesn't end, there's no closure. When others start to tell your story, it becomes like a toy they can play with, build on, change, manipulate and discard at their leisure. The humanity somehow just slips away. I should also caution that this is a story with a much higher quantity of foul language than usual. There will be a number of derogatory terms coming up, just to let you know. This is case number 160, and it's called On the Shoulder, and you can hear it in full after these messages. The New Ghost Stories podcast is supported by Horrified, the website that celebrates and champions British horror, covering films, television, books, fiction and more. You can visit Horrified at horrifiedmagazine.co.uk and find them on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Horrified Mag. They told you to be careful coming over to me, didn't they? Don't creep up behind him. And whatever you do, don't touch him on the shoulder. Well, yeah, I got a story to tell you. Record it if you want. I don't give a fuck what they think. And I don't give a fuck what you think either. No offence. Suppose you'll want it from the beginning. Started in a place like this. Only worse, the crown and anchor. That was a boozer with character. He came off into the street smelling of it. Stained carpets, stink of fags. Last year's flies still in the window. The only air that got let in there was when someone's head got put through the window. Sounds like a shithole. And it was. But it was our shithole. The crew in there, we was close. Real close. You didn't get strangers in there. At least not for very long. Used to call it the turning point. The spot on the doormat where after getting a good look at the place, they'd turn around and go back. There was a good crowd in there, mostly. There was a time when it were just us City fans. But then the landlord, can't remember his name. Fucking gambler. Fat bastard. 
He had to sell up half the place for his debts, and then his brother-in-law takes over. He's a fucking Vale fan. So suddenly the place gets cleaned up, and we get this other crowd in. I mean, they're fine for a while, but you can't talk about the game anymore, because after nine o'clock, when everyone's had a few, it kicks off. There were punch-ups, and the old bill started getting involved. The new landlord got a warning or some shit. He started having to bar and report folk who got into scraps. So it was all on our best behaviour for a while. But by then some of the Vale lot had already got scared off. So that helped. But there was this one fucker. Terry his name was. Terry Coles. Fucking mouth on legs. Everyone knew Terry Coles. Mostly because he could never shut the fuck up. You didn't want to know him. He just started going on at you. On and on. And he used to like winding folk up too. Really funny guy. Really funny piss taker. Worse than that, he was a fucking United fan too. He used to like needling me because I got a bit of a rough streak in me. Can't help it, always been like that. You'd think that'd make him leave well alone. But no, it becomes like a bloody challenge. Can you wind Carl up tonight? Can you make him see red? It was like he had a fucking death wish. So we used to get leery over the matches and the like. It wasn't just that, though. He'd always have some fucking funny thing to say about your clothes and shoes and stuff. Like he was trying to prove something. You'd come in and he'd take the piss out of your jacket. You'd tell him to piss off. Then he'd have a go because you weren't over the moon that he was taking the piss out of you. So this one time, I just hit him. Smacked him clean off his feet. He wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I could get Larry. But I didn't normally just lash out like that. Of course, that put a chip on his shoulder because he couldn't get back at me. My mates and his. If you could call them mates, they probably couldn't fucking stand him either. They got in the way and stopped him from taking a swing back at me. But I was already in trouble with a new landlord over a fight a few weeks back. I mean, I didn't get in fights often. Not like me to just lash out, like I said. But these fucking students had decided to come in, probably just for a laugh. And those poncy fucks can rub a man up the wrong way. With their pants hanging around their trousers. And their, we're the fucking bee's knees, future of mankind, bloody smugness. I'd had one too many and they'd gotten too fucking noisy. So I told them where to go. And they got mouthy with me, so I lamped one of them. New landlord's son. How was I supposed to know? So I was about to get barred when his brother, old landlord, and still half owner, what was his name? He comes and stands up for me. Bless him, he's known me for years. Sure, I got a temper, but mostly I keeps it to myself. Don't cause trouble. So I'm getting my last warning now. Do it again and you're out. I don't want to find myself another local. I don't want to lose me mates. Not over a prick like Terry Coles. He makes a big deal about shaking hands and forgiving me. And biting my tongue, I just go along with it. But he still knows I can't stand his guts. So that's not the end. Like everyone else, i got to sing his tune. And he has to have me licking his boots. Hanging on is every stupid word. I tries to avoid him whenever he's there. And he always gives me this look like, here comes trouble, here comes a headache. I ain't doing nothing, just keeping to myself, enjoying a pint, chatting to me mates. But no, he still has to have his pops and jokes and what else. Can't leave me fucking be. Well, this one night he went too far. I just had this big fucking row with my lad and I'm in there blowing off steam. I walk in with my face red and he gives me that glance of his and I just shout, What? What's your problem? He makes it all innocent like he doesn't know what he's doing. My mates though, they know what it's about so they give me a wide berth, keep the conversation light. But it's Tosser Terry. He keeps trying to start with me. Results are on the telly, he's making cracks about City and he's looking at me while he makes them. I know he is. Then somebody tells him, I don't know who, but somebody tells him my boys are queer. 
We've been rowing all afternoon. That's why I'm in a fucking mood. I don't like it, and I've never fucking liked it. He's supposed to be a man. But now that he knows, he's got to come over and say something. So he walks right up to me while I'm sat at the bar. He slaps his hand on my shoulder and he says to me, Mate, I just heard your son's a puff. Fuck, I wouldn't have that in my family. If my lad turned out to be a batty boy, I'd fucking chuck that kid out in the street. I've had about eight pints and I just fucking lose it. Whatever my son is, he's still my lad. And I just couldn't take anybody saying any of that shit about him. So I pick up my pint and I glass him, smash it right in his fucking face. He goes down and I give him a good fucking kicking as much as I can before they stop me. He doesn't get back up and the landlord tells me I'm barred so I tell him to fuck off and storm out the place. Then I goes home and I fall asleep in front of the telly. Then about two hours later I get a knock on the door, a loud banging. I wake up and see out the window that it's the fucking filth. I open the door and they tell me that I haven't just glassed Terry Coles. That I fucking killed him. A shard of glass went straight under his eyelid and pierced his brain. I'm so pissed off my head I say, well, that wouldn't do much because he ain't got a fucking brain. I know I said that because they said it back to me at the trial. I'm pissed out of my head. I don't know what I'm saying. We'll still used it against me. I mean, I, lo- I didn't like the guy. I hated his guts. But I wouldn't have killed him on purpose. I'm no murderer. But the police had got it in for me and I go down for it. 18 months for manslaughter. Although they let me out after 12. Lucky, lucky me. They say prison's too soft these days. Like a fucking Butlin's holiday camp. But I'm cooped up there with these same tossers for 12 months. Nowhere to go, nothing to drink. Can't even watch the game. Make the best of it. Read a bit. Yeah, I do know how to read. But Jesus Christ, that place did my head in. It was enough to drive me over. But I ain't no coward. No coward's way out for me. Even if I did think about it. Thought about it fucking hard. So I lose my place and have to move in with my sister and her husband, who's a slimy prick. But I take it because Lisa's a good girl and she doesn't have to take in an old tosser like me. I guess back on my feet soon enough. If these haulage companies turned their nose up at thugs and hooligans like me, they'd have no one bloody working for them. Not that they don't take advantage and cut your pay for it. Getting my life back on track wasn't the big problem, though. I mean, my lad, he ain't fucking talking to me. But now unusual about that. No, the problem was... Terry fucking Coles. Yeah, I know he's dead. I fucking killed him. But that ain't stopped him from making my life miserable. That ain't stopped him coming after me. It happened first one night as I'm coming back from the pub. I've had a couple, not too many. I'm on my best behaviour because I could still get sent back inside. The street's empty, totally quiet. You can't even hear the wind or sound of traffic from the A road. You could hear a pin drop's echo. That's how quiet it was. And I'm just walking down the road, on my way home, minding my own business, when I feel it. This great big hand slapping down on my shoulder, just like it was some mate of mine. I almost jump out of my shoes. I spin around expecting to see some geezer behind me. But there's no one there. No one there. The street's empty. But in my head, there's one face I can see. It's Terry Coles. He's just put his hand on my shoulder to express his deep fucking sympathy about my son being a puff. There's no one there, but I can't get that image of him out of my mind. His stupid big eyes and phony, friendly grin. I'm run home because I'm that scared shitless. Next day, I just put it down to the drink. You have a few and you can get strange ideas. I try not to think about it because it freaks me out. But that next day I promised to take Lisa's eldest Candice up to Hanley for some clothes shopping. That's if you can call them clothes. There weren't enough fabric on them to blow your nose on. So I'm walking around with her on a wet Saturday as she goes in and out of these shops, none of which I've ever heard of. And then we're heading back to the bus station 
and walking down the end of the high street. And it happens again. Great big hand slaps down on my shoulder. I go ice cold. I spin around and look at all the people and none of them are looking at me. No one's right behind me. They're just walking past, wondering what the fuck's wrong with this guy. He looks mental. And I'm going mental. I'm looking at all these people and I start shouting, Who touched me? Who was it? Which one of you put your hand on my shoulder? Candace is dying of embarrassment. She don't want me there in the first place. She asks me what I'm doing and I point right at her and shout, Was it you? She says, Fuck no. Foul mouth she's got. What the fuck's wrong with you? So I'm stood there looking like a bloody lunatic because I know, I know that Terry Coles is there and he's watching me, laughing at me. It was hard that first year. Any place, any time. Terry hadn't changed much. He knows just how to get under your skin. Like when you're at the checkout, just as you're about to hand over your money, the woman behind the till will say to you, that's 960, dear, and the handle slap down on your shoulder. It's like getting ice water down your back. Totally knocks the wind out of you. I used to drop my money, spill it all over the floor. He'd do it just then to make me look like an idiot. He likes to make me look fucking stupid. His other favourite is to do it when I'm playing a game and winning. Whether it was pool or darts or cards, that slap on the shoulder and I'd lose it. The game would be over. I'd be fucked. Couldn't hit a ball. Couldn't hit the board. Couldn't make a bet. Bit by bit, he started to ruin my life. Can't go for a pint without a slap on the shoulder. And then my pint's all over the floor and I'm losing it in front of strangers and kicking off. I couldn't work because you can't drive when some fuck decides to pay you a visit from beyond the grave. I'd be driving and then he'd slap his hand down on me and I'd lose control. There was this crash. I mean, I went off the road. I only took out some edges, but the cops saw me. Then a few weeks later, I stop on the motorway. Couldn't help it. He put his hand down on my shoulder and I slammed on the brakes. Car goes straight into the back of me. Some guy gets whiplash and concussion. Probably lucky they want a pile up. But I lose my license and I lose my job. It got so fucking bad I couldn't leave the house for a while. Council put me in this dingy flat once Lisa and Neville turned me out. But I stopped going out. You see this hair? This hair was brown like wood before I went to prison. Now look at it. I got a fucking old man's hair. It's the dread of it happening that's the worst. You don't know when it'll happen. You don't know when he's going to put his hand on your shoulder. He picks his times. He knows exactly when to time it. This one time he even did it when I was taking a piss. Knocks me cock out of me hand and has me piss all over my trousers right before a game. Big fucking laugh, eh? Sometimes I think I can hear him laughing. Splitting his fucking sides because he's so fucking funny. Ended up on benefits. Council thought I was agoraphobic. Is that what they call it when you can't go outside? I had to go see a psychiatrist. What a fucking joke. It had to stop then. It was no fun if I stayed at home. He couldn't humiliate me if I was indoors. No, he had to leave me alone for a while. Let me get my shit back together. Let me think maybe he was going to leave me alone. He left me alone for a long time, maybe six or more months without a touch. He let me get my life back on track. I got a job with a cousin of mine, helping him run his betting shop. I know my games and my odds and numbers. I get the council to come over and paint my walls, get the dingy flat looking a bit brighter. He even talks to my kid a few times. He's happy, so I suppose that's something. It wasn't long before he decides to let me know he hasn't forgotten about me. This time it wasn't to humiliate me or wind me up. I was just shifting some stuff downstairs from my flat to my storage cupboard on ground floor. I was unlocking the door and his hand came down on my shoulder. It wasn't a big, too friendly slap like it used to be. It was just this slight touch. Just a reminder that he hadn't done with me yet. And I didn't like it. And I didn't take it like I used to. Didn't go ice cold. I was expecting him. If not then, then sometime. I know how this prick's mind works. I knew he'd be back. Pricks like Terry Coles can never leave well alone. That probably annoyed him. 
I got over it a bit, you see. There's worse things in life than being tapped by undead wind-up merchants. Should have pretended, should have played along. Because now he knew he had to up his game. He was quiet again for a while. Let months go by before he has another go. I'm at Stoke Station waiting to catch train down to Sea City away. I'm on my own because most people stay away from me these days because they think I'm a nut job. But I'm still going to matches. Fuck the lot of them. I've stood on the platform waiting and I see train coming in from the distance. So I pick up my bag ready for when it arrives. Then just as it's pulling into the platform, I feel that hand on my shoulder. I go stiff, cold, that's normal. But then that hand pushes me. It shoves me off the platform. I land on the tracks just an inch away from the electric line. The train's coming towards me and people are screaming and shouting. And I can see it coming for me. And I cover my eyes and I scream. Very nearly piss my pants. No joke. But Terry, he knows what I don't. But this ain't the long train. It's just a short one. Four carriages instead of six. It's already stopped well ahead of me. And they're screaming on the track like a bloody girl when it's already stopped. Still. Fucking hilarious, eh? That's our new game. He's trying to kill me. But he hasn't decided when yet. So he's toying with me. Waiting till I let my guard down. Last week it was the tram. I'm in Manchester for the away game and he gives me a shove just as the tram's coming in to stop. I'm out of the way fast enough before it can hit me. But if I wasn't on me toes it would have taken me down. Drive has a right go. People are laughing, saying I just jumped out. I don't rise to it. What's the fucking point? He's had plenty of goes. I can't walk downstairs if there's no banister. Can't walk down the middle. Have to have my hand on the rail. He's had a go at me on stairs more than once. Can't walk on the roadside of the pavement because he might shove me off. Got to be careful in the kitchen too. You see that? That's what happened when he pushed me against the cooker that one time. Treatment in hospital for second degree burns. Even hurt to wipe my fucking ass for weeks. One day he'll get bored and have done with it. I won't help him. But you know what? I ain't going to put up that much of a fight. I mean, what have I got? I got no friends. My family doesn't want me near him. I'm out of work again because my stupid cousin fucked up his taxes. I got no friends and no boozer. No pubs around here will have me in them anymore. I'm trouble, a nutter, a fucking killer. They'll only have me in here because they think I'm funny. Fucking students. Crazy Carl. It's all such a fucking laugh to them. Buy Carl a drink and he'll tell you about the ghost that taps him on the shoulder. They have ghosts sometimes, creep up behind me and touch me on the shoulder, see if I go mental. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. They ought to have barred me here too, but I think I actually bring the punters in. I become part of the fucking furniture, because I got nowhere else to go. So you get it all down. You get it all down for your book, so you and your mates can have a good old laugh at crazy old Carl. I look forward to reading about it. I can read, you know. Then one day when you hear about me, how I got mowed down in the road, or pushed off a bridge or drowned in the canal, well then you can have a great big fucking laugh too then, can't you? I have kept tabs on Carl over the years to see what would happen to his story if things really would end the way that he thought they would. There were long periods when I heard nothing, when he seemed to fall off the map and I would become concerned. Only then for him to appear again, the same as he'd always been. I finally lost track of him before the Covid pandemic. To my knowledge, he's not been seen since lockdown began. And yet I cannot find any obituary for him. As far as I can see, he is still with us. Somewhere. If you know who this man is, and you have any further information, I would be glad to hear it. Thank you for listening to the New Ghost Stories podcast. If you've enjoyed listening to the podcast, please consider becoming a patron 
by visiting patreon.com slash new ghost stories. You can also support the podcast by liking or leaving a review on any platform and subscribing to hear future releases. And this story features in the book 11 New Ghost Stories, which is available from Amazon, Apple Books and other book retailers. This podcast is written, presented and produced by me, David Paul Nixon. If you'd like to read more from me, visit my substack at davidpaulnixon.substack.com. You can find out more about New Ghost Stories at my website, newghoststories.com. And for all the latest updates, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at New Ghost Stories. Next time on the New Ghost Stories podcast, it seemed like he had finally got out from under her thumb. But would she ever truly leave him?